16. Zoe asked Carlton how to get to the garage, assuming they had one. He led Zoe and Armando to a library, where pulling a certain book caused a shelf to slide over and reveal an elevator, because of course it did. Though Zoe noticed the spine of the secret book had been covered with masking tape, onto which garage was scrawled in magic marker. The elevator took them down one floor to a cavernous showroom that contained at least 50 cars. There was a nice variety of long luxury cars, SUVs, and low, crouching sports cars with tinted windows and paint jobs so glossy you could have used the reflection to apply mascara. As they made their way down the aisle, Zoe found she had left Armando behind. He was carefully examining one sinister flat black sports car. It had bulbous fenders that curved around and down the front like a pair of scowling eyebrows, with a blood-red triangular vent in the center of the hood, like the car had sustained a fatal wound. Armando looked like he wanted to cry. Zoe said, Is that an expensive one? This is a 2020 Bugatti Chiron, 1500 horsepower, widely thought to be the apex of the gasoline-powered automobile. Only 30 of them were manufactured. At top speed, it gets three miles to the gallon, which means you could get a $500 ticket just for being caught driving it today. Looks pretty cool. This, Zoe, is a $20 million car. Oh, wow. I bet the insurance is outrageous. Armando realized he had picked a terrible partner for this conversation, sighed, and glanced around the room. Zoe said, You, uh, want to drive it? I would die a happy man but for the situation we're walking into, we're taking that. He nodded toward a big black sedan with tinted windows parked next to a bigger blacker box truck like you'd use to deliver furniture. Zoe actually wasn't sure which vehicle he was referring to, but Armando walked to the sedan, opening the doors and trunk. He seemed to approve of what he saw. A bulletproof glass, half-inch thick, titanium shell around the whole body, carbon fiber inner shell, silica and polyethylene glycol corticat shrapnel, emergency oxygen system, run flat tires, threat detection AI, emergency pathfinding navigation, refrigerator in the trunk for blood supply should an emergency transfusion be needed. Is that good? A direct hit with an anti-tank rocket would not stop this vehicle. If somehow the driver was killed, the car would drive itself to safety. Cool. You can tell that just by looking? I recognize the model. It's the same one the president uses. Get in. He was nodding toward the back seat when he said it, but Zoe took the front. Armando slid in, threw the briefcase Zoe hadn't noticed him carrying and into the back seat, and began tinkering with the windshield display. They had to pass through two separate garage doors to get out, the first closing behind them before the next opened, which Zoe assumed was to make sure nobody could wait outside the door and rush into the house while they were pulling out. The scenic rich people enclave around the casa was positioned to give the illusion that it was way out in the country, but only five minutes of driving put them back in view of the flickering forest of glass and girders that was downtown Tabula Rasa. As she watched, a huge animated car raced across the skyline, an ad that spanned five buildings announcing a Christmas sales event at the local Chain Fane dealership. They weren't even all the way downtown and Zoe was already getting a headache. They took an off-ramp, and before long, the scenery changed to hainer-sized buildings, warehouses, and silos. Zoe wondered if she owned any of it. Her phone went off, and the word Mom hovered over it. Hey, Mom, can you hear me? Hey, Z, saw you left a message. You having a good time in the city? You didn't watch the news, did you? No. Well, when you do, don't have a panic attack. Everything is fine. I was accosted by a man on the train, but it turned out okay. Then I was accosted by another man, but he's... Everything's fine now. That's what you should take away from this. Oh my god, where are you now? Did you talk to the police? It's all taken care of. I'm driving around the city now in one of Dad's cars. Or my car, I guess. Did he bequeath you a car? Are you going to keep it? It's a long story, but I think you left me some money. Hey, we can get the refrigerator fixed. Sure. It's, um, kind of complicated. I was joking about the refrigerator, honey. The money is yours. Buy yourself a vacation and leave a little to get something practical for yourself. You're a big girl and you can decide, but you know what I say, experiences are worth way more than stuff. It's a lot of money, Mom. In fact, I think you left me all of it. Silence. Trucks were rumbling past outside. 
and they passed warning signs along the road depicting stick figures suffering various industrial accidents. Finally, Zoe's mother said, What a bastard. I know, Mom. He should have left it to you. Oh no, he knew better than that. Zoe, I hope you've grown up enough to know that all he did was dump his burden on you. You shouldn't have to suffer from his stupid addiction. He was an addict? Honey, you don't make that kind of money unless you're addicted to making it. These stockbrokers who work hundred-hour weeks piling billions on top of billions, you think they could stop, even if they wanted to? It really did seem like he was having a good time. Of course, because 100% of his energy was devoted to building up appearances. You remember Elba, the, uh, the cat lady, used to live in the blue trailer? When she died, they found she had over 50 cats in there, and they ate her face? Ew, gross, yes, I remember that. So why do we call her crazy for piling her trailer full of more cats than she could take care of, but applaud when somebody accumulates more money than they can spend? They're both hoarders. All right, all right, I shouldn't have brought it up. I know how much you hated him. Don't ever say that. I never hated that man for one second. He gave me the most beautiful, perfect daughter in the whole wide world. I have a sister? You definitely inherited his smart mouth, Missy. Armando was steering them around orange cones in a flashing sign that was trying to tell them the road ahead was closed. My suggestion is you just bail out and let them take care of it. I'm betting that within the next week a swarm of lawyers and creditors and loan sharks and lord knows who else are all going to show up at the door. In my mind, you are under absolutely no obligation to put up with any of that. Life's too short. Like I said, it's complicated. I say just keep it up to do something fun. Heck, Take a few thousand dollars, ride the train down to Vegas, and just blow it all. Get one of those fancy hotel rooms with a big bubble bath, pick up some handsome boy, make a bunch of mistakes, and then come home and tell me all about it. Okay, I should go. Just make sure he uses protection. Mom! God! Goodbye, honey. See you Sunday. She hung up and Armando said, We're coming up on it here. Zoe saw what was ahead and said, Oh, wow. The car stopped at a barricade, flashing an announcement that the inlet road was closed and that no one was permitted beyond that point. Beyond it, Zoe could see the aftermath of the explosion. It was a giant, perfect circle of black. It looked like God had reached down and taken out a football field-sized hunk of earth with a huge ice cream scooper. Arthur Livingston had gone out in a spectacular fashion, almost as if he had planned it that way. Armando said, It broke windows fifteen blocks away. Andre and Bud pulled up alongside them in Andre's Bentley. Zoe stepped out and they all walked past the flashing barriers and made their way toward the blast crater. Within ten steps, she was walking precariously on a jagged pile of debris, busted cinder blocks and shards of glass and twisted metal beams that got more treacherous as she neared the black bowl where the warehouse had been. There were yellow bulldozers and backhoes and other vehicles scattered around the crater like toys, making it look like a giant sandbox some enormous toddler had been playing in. Everything smelled like burnt toast. From behind her, Bud said, You see that black gunk splattered all over them bricks there? That's glass. When this place blew, it melted in an instant and sprayed every which way. What could do this? I mean, I know it was a warehouse, but what was in it? You figure it out. Be sure to let the rest of us know, all right? Andre said, That's Will, out there by the crane. Andre tromped off into the charred wasteland, and Bud followed. Zoe glanced back at Armando, who said, It's not a good ambush location, if that's what you're wondering. No choke points and no place to hide gunmen. Zoe nodded toward his little black briefcase. Is that full of guns? Not full, no, but we've got a few things in here we might find useful should things go sour. They trudged out into the crater, and Zoe asked, Should I have a gun? Just in case? What kind of training do you have? I've seen a lot of movies. As far as I can tell, as long as you're the good guy, the bullets just go right into their heads. It's only the bad guys that miss. I can sign you up for a six-week course, and after that we can talk about you carrying. But otherwise, no. Six weeks? I don't intend to be here for six days if I can help it. So what if a psychopath jumps me in an alley when you're not there? The gun without the training just means you're giving your attacker a free gun. They crunched through the charred landscape until they got close enough for Zoe to see that Will was standing next to a ruined truck. It was a pickup with a Livingston Construction logo on the side, 
and it had been twisted completely around. The rear wheels were upright, the cab was upside down, everything in between looking like it had been run like a wet rag. Echo was crouched near a bumper, examining it like a crime scene tech. Zoe wondered how in the hell she had traversed the crater in those heels. Zoe said to Will, I'm here. Show me what you got to show me. Will just gestured toward the twisted truck. Zoe shook her head. What am I looking at? The truck? It looks like it made it out of the explosion better than the building did. Will shook his head. This didn't happen in the blast. The truck belongs to the cleanup crew. They left it parked here last night. This is what it looked like this morning. I don't understand. Echo said, Look at the bumper. Zoe walked around to the front and Echo said, You see those dents? Two of them, each about as wide as a hand, about four feet apart on the bumper? One on top, one on bottom? All right. Now imagine in your mind a person grabbing the bumper so that they could twist a truck in half with their bare hands. That's where the dents would be. Oh. Oh. A freaking person had done this? Zoe felt a sinking in her gut. Suddenly, the five of them seemed very exposed, standing out here in the open. Jesus. Will asked, Now do you understand? Not in the least. It's a threat, intended for us. Or rather you, since now these are your trucks. It's from Molech. There's that name again. What's this guy's deal? Will pulled out his phone and brought up a video feed. This is from a drone, above us right now. Look. It was an overhead view of the dark circle of the blast crater, zooming in until Zoe could see the six of them standing around the twisted truck. The ruined vehicle was, she could now see, part of a message that could only be viewed from the sky. The truck they were examining formed the lower part of a capital L. Scattered around the crater were the remains of probably a dozen other vehicles that had been torn apart and rearranged to form four letters. G-O-L-D. Zoe said, what, he wants Arthur's gold? He can have it. Tell this mole that she can pick it up or we'll drive it to him. Whatever's convenient. Throw it in the trunk. We'll take it right now. I totally don't care. Will shook his head. It doesn't make any sense. Are you saying we don't have any gold? Andre answered. Oh, I'm sure Arthur had some somewhere. Gold and platinum and several hundred other commodities that made up a portfolio that even he barely kept track of. If somebody stole the gold Arthur owned, he probably wouldn't have even noticed. Probably kept it in a cigar box in his basement. Bud said, It's like if somebody kidnapped your family and their only ransom demand was a jar of mayonnaise. Zoe asked, Okay, and why do these people seem to have superpowers again? Are they magic? Will said, No, but the reality isn't any less alarming. Tell me. Information like that, Miss Ash, is precisely the kind of helpful insight I bring to the table as one of the chairmen of Livingston Enterprises. Unfortunately, I am not currently employed in that capacity, as you know. Ah, that's what this is about. You want a share of the money? I want to not get torn in half by one of Molech's carnival freaks. Whatever our differences, I think you and I have that in common. And if you look at this twisted wreck behind me, you will understand why I am growing alarmed. I'm sorry if I haven't exactly had time to be polite about this. Ah, and this is the part where you try to convince me you're really a nice guy after all. I'm not a nice guy but I am on your side. Don't confuse the two. You hate me because I'm blunt and have no patience for wasted time or wasted words, because I'm not nice. Well, a lot of nice people are nice because they figured out it's a great way to get things from other people. Some of the slimiest snakes I've run across have been nice. So let me tell you now, if you ever see me resort to being nice, run. Forgive me if I'm not a genius negotiator like you, but my fragile little woman brain is telling me that just because the other guys are monsters doesn't automatically mean you're not. You'll change your mind when you hear what I have to say. Armando was nervously scanning the lip of the crater, then the sky, as if something was going to swoop down and spit fire at them at any moment. Zoe, I no longer consider this a safe meeting location. I was thinking guns earlier, not whatever did that. Will said, I agree. There's a nice meeting room in Livingston Tower. It has walls, chairs, and alcohol. Hell, we'll take you up to the roof and you can go for a ride in your own helicopter. Zoe asked Armando. Zoe asked Armando. You know where that is? Armando smirked. <laughs> People on airplanes flying 30,000 feet over the city know where Livingston Tower is. It's pretty hard to miss. Is it safe? It's a crowded building full of armed security, so I guess the question is, safe from what? 17.
Livingston Tower was the tallest and weirdest building that we had ever seen in person. The structure that loomed in the windshield of the sedan was banana-shaped and flat black at the moment. Romano noted that it could turn any color, the black was for mourning, and the banana curve caused it to lean over the street below, as if in the process of being blown over by a hard wind. There was something vaguely obscene about it. Actually, no, it wasn't vague at all. As they approached, Zoe asked Armando, So that's my building. I own the whole thing. And it's full of your employees, too. Weird. So she could just walk in there and just fire them all. Ruin their lives just like that. They arrived at the circular drive in front of a row of revolving doors. Zoe said, Don't stop. Pull back out to the street. Keep going. To where? Somewhere other than here. If this is where they want to meet, I want to go whatever the opposite of this place is. They rounded a corner, and Zoe saw the two trailing vehicles, driven by Will and Andre, follow them. She looked around for a sleazy bar or maybe a Chuck E. Cheese they could meet in. They passed a high-end massage parlor, a three-story tall shop advertising military-grade weapons for sale, and another fast-food franchise she had never heard of, a place called Korea Streets that boasted dishes called Bindaduk and Mandu. Undulating across the windows above them all was a row of texts that shouted, Livingston Memorial and Drop Party Tomorrow, 5 o'clock p.m. until everyone has passed out. And then she saw it. It was a ragged, half-finished building that looked like 40 stories of stacked garbage. Tarps, sheets, cardboard, plywood. Zoe said, Ew, what happened to that place? Smoke poured from dozens of haphazard gaps where windows should have been. Is it on fire? Armando said, That's just people trying to keep warm, and I think you own that place. This whole plaza is yours, unless I'm mistaken. What happened to it? It looks like the front was blown off by a bomb. This is as far as construction got. It was supposed to be uh, upscale condos. Broke ground five years ago. They got the frame up and the concrete down. Then it got stalled over some legal thing. Over time, the homeless started squatting there until it just filled up. Everybody calls it Squatterville. Pull over. This is where we're meeting. Armando looked alarmed. I'm going to advise against that, for reasons I should not have to state out loud. We're driving a rocket-proof luxury tank. I think we can risk getting within 50 feet of poor people. Armando reluctantly did what he was told, and Zoe remembered that he didn't really have a choice. This whole employer-employee thing was intoxicating. The car pulled onto a patch of weed-riddled concrete in the shadow of the battered structure. Zoe gawked up at it. It looked post-apocalyptic. Andre's Bentley and Will's sports car pulled up behind them. Armando nodded back towards Will's vehicle and said, Aston Martin Vanquish. 2023, I think. Zoe and Armando got out of the car. Zoe looked up and was met with faces leaning down from every floor of the crumbling tower, rumor of the luxury sedans with the tinted windows having made it all the way to the roof. The place had a grapevine that could transmit information faster than wireless. The first floor was almost entirely open, even the framework of the unfinished walls having been torn away at some point presumably for scrap. A crowd of people were milling about in between exposed concrete pillars that Zoe thought looked ready to buckle at a moment's notice, everyone lining up in front of folding tables packed with food. If Zoe was famous in Tabula Rasa, her fame hadn't reached this group. All she got were annoyed stares from people ready to fly into a rage if it looked like she was about to cut in front of them in line. She walked toward the crowd, then felt a hand clamp down on her shoulder before she could make it inside. Armando said, Let's keep our distance. Another, more deliberate set of footsteps approached. Zoe turned and saw that only Will had exited his vehicle, presumably to ask them what the hell they were doing. Before he could reach them, he was accosted by a huge guy who had tattoos instead of hair on his skull, bundles of snakes like Medusa. The man seemed to be muttering a series of demands and threats at Will as he passed. Will, never even glancing at the man, reached into his inside pocket, pulled out his wallet, and handed it to him without breaking stride. When Will reached Zoe, she asked, Did you just get mugged? What are we doing here? I changed my mind. This is where I want to meet. Will glanced up at the smoking tower and let out an annoyed sigh. Zoe said, Armando says I own it. This, said Will, is one of 10,000 headaches you'll be taking on if you insist on staying in Tabula Rasa. Five floors above them, a filthy naked man was standing in front of an open section of wall, washing his crotch with a bottle of water. 
Will turned and motioned to Andre, Bud, and Echo to join them. All three faces looked terrified. Workers were hustling nearby, hauling containers out from the backs of a pair of box trucks in the parking lot, carrying them to the tables. Zoe asked, Who are those people? You're paying them. This whole thing. It's a property line dispute with the people building the parking garage next door. The courts eventually ruled in their favor, which means this building has to come down and be moved 30 feet that way. But that will mean running out all of your squatters up there, and that didn't sit too well with your father. He had the Livingston Foundation set up a soup kitchen down here and, con and contracted with a catering company to come in three times a day, every day, while he stalled with the court order. Zoe watched filthy people continue to pile up in front of the folding tables, lines becoming undefined clumps, stage two of a process that seemed destined to progress to unruly crowd and then riot. Half of the people in line were kids. Most of the rest were women. A morbidly obese man in a beard was arguing with a wall. A toddler was picking off pieces of his sandwich and feeding them to a bony dog. There were a lot of smokers. Will said, See that lady over there? The one with the dry diarrhea down the back of her pants. You could put her up in a mansion and hire servants to wait on her the rest of her life. Or, you could leave her here, to drink herself to death in her own filth. Same for every person in this building. Every person in the city. You have the power of life and death. How's it feel? Zoe was scanning the food table. From what she could see, the selection wasn't great. There was some kind of thick vegetable stew, and loaves of generic bread, lunch meat and cheese they were making sandwiches from, plastic tubs of apples that no one was taking, plastic tubs of bananas and oranges that were going faster, bottles of water, bottles of imitation juice, generic soda. Zoe said, Well, maybe I'll just give away the whole estate, sell all the land and give it to these people. What do you think about that? Will cocked an eyebrow and said, because you're a good person, right? Unlike me? But why do you consider yourself to be a good person? Back in the trailer park, how many times did you think I'd rescue all of these people and feed all of the sick children if only I had the money? It's real easy to say, isn't it? But then you actually get the money, and you find out some things about yourself. You realize how much of what you used to consider morality was just powerlessness. You took for granted the enormous comfort that comes with knowing that none of your choices could hurt anyone outside of your own four walls. And that, Zoe, is when you find out the terrible truth of every downtrodden person who has climbed to the top, that if put in the same shoes as the bullies, we'd be just as bad, or worse. God, you must love listening to yourself talk. Look around. Do you want to have to make the final call in this building? It'll have to happen soon. The structure will become unsafe if it sits much longer. So what happens to the families if you give the demolition order? What happens if you do nothing but gravity does the demolition for you? The other three had arrived, everyone standing in a tight group as if huddling together would create a bubble that would keep out the poverty. A drunken elderly man tried to join them, shouting something about their mothers. Armando simply opened his jacket to show the man the gun in its holster. The man shuffled away. Zoe said, First item on the agenda, Will Blackwater has 30 seconds to somehow make me feel better about the severed hand in my house. Bud said, Oh, that was Sazenbacher's hand. Will nodded and said, Kowalski was able to get it from the coroner's office after the autopsy, not like they were going to convict anyway. Zoe said, Who? Bud answered, Brandon Sanzenbacher, the crazy fellow with the doll head you dawn roasted to death, the soul collector. Who cut his hand off? Andre said, No one. It happened on its own. Did you not watch the news coverage of your own hostage situation? Why would I? I was there. Bud said, he exploded into little pieces, just as you were leaving the train station, like he had a stick of dynamite up his ass. I wasn't playing dumb back at the house. I honestly didn't know they were going to bring chunks of the guy in for examination. He shot an admonishing glance at Echo. I eat on that table. Andre said, To me? Looked like a Transformer Blue. You ever seen that happen? I mean, a, a Transformer like you have on utility poles, not them robots that turn into cars. Looks just like that. A flash of white and blue, bright enough to leave spots in your eyes. Zoe said, and why would he spontaneously explode? Will answered, the device he had inside him, the thing that was generating electricity. It failed. Overloaded. Shorted out. Whatever. I'm going to speculate that if he had discharged it properly, that you, Zoe, and everything within ten feet of you would have been charred to a crisp. I don't know how much juice this guy had inside him, but... Inside him? Do you really want to know this? Zoe threw up her hands. I apparently have to. Echo said, here. This is what we were looking at when your cat tried to eat the hand. 
She laid her phone on the hood of the armored sedan and tapped through menus until a holographic projection of a hand floated above it, rotating slowly. Echo tapped the phone again, and the flesh vanished from the hand, revealing the bones underneath. Andre grimaced at the ghostly skeleton hand hovering menacingly over the car, then glanced up at the vagrants in the building above him and said, Man, these people are going to think we're doing some kind of voodoo ritual down here. Echo said, See these white lines running down his fingers? All on the bones here. Those are wires. Conductive graphene braids, to be exact. This is how he did the lightning. They all run back to a device in his palm. That's this square here, which was wired up to... We're not sure what. Zoe said, So, he had something implanted in his body. Will said, Something incredible. There's a device the military uses, called a laser-induced plasma channel. It fires a beam through the air, a pulse so strong that it creates plasma by separating electrons from air molecules, basically unleashing a bolt of lightning. To me, this looks like a micro version of that of one of those. But here's the thing. The military version has to be able to generate a pulse of around 50 billion watts. That's why their version is so big it has to be carried on the back of a tank. But this guy, said Echo, seemed to have the equivalent stashed in the palm of his hand. Zoe said, how does a crazy guy on a train get something like that installed? Echo said, Presumably the same way an even crazier guy would get strength implants added to his limbs, or jaws that can bite through steel. That's not even the question we're asking right now. The issue at the moment is that the device shouldn't even be possible. Andre said, There were weird rumors over the last couple of months. Dead bodies with freaky injuries or their brains fried. A couple guys spontaneously combusted. One guy managed to get himself lodged into the engine of an airliner at 30,000 feet, somehow. At first, it came off like a viral blink hoax, but, yeah, it turns out that some of the shady characters in this city now have powers. Zoe grabbed her hair and growled in frustration. Okay, just how much more information are you people withholding from me? Because every new layer of this thing is more terrifying than the last. Will said, so now you understand the state of mind we were in when you arrived. Oh, yeah, you've convinced me. I want no part of this nonsense. This whole city is a butt that farts horror. Another of the vagrants had wandered over, this one also shouting about someone's mother. Either he was copycatting the first guy, or else the mother thing was some kind of popular insult in Squatterville. Zoe looked to Armando, who was standing between them and their unruly masses, looking ready to draw several guns. She said, I've got a bodyguard question. There's this huge bounty on my head. Is there a way to buy myself out of it? If I just pay off this molech and leave town? Will his henchmen follow me? Will interjected. Zoe, that's not the question. The issue is if you stay... Hush! Hush! I asked Armando. Armando gave careful thought to it, and, without taking his eyes off of the crowd, said, Remember what I said, about how if a threat gets close enough to you that I have to physically deal with it, that I have already failed at my job? That's because my job is to deter adversaries long before a conflict even begins, to make it clear that any attempt to harm you is so futile that it doesn't warrant leaving the house. In a city where there's no authority, that fear, that reputation, is all you have to keep the wolves at bay, a name that follows you like a black cloud. Do you understand? It's the same reason the crazy guy on the train glued doll heads to his crotch. Exactly. A while back, a snitch started working with the prosecutors, back when this city still had them said he was going to give up Molech's identity and tie him to this mass shooting in a nightclub. That snitch was dragged out of his home by Molech's men. They strung him up in the park by the fountain, upside down, hanging by his ankles, and poured molten glass into his nostrils. It burned through his sinuses and ran out his eye sockets before it finally burned through his brain. See, they do it upside down so the man can continue screaming the whole time, right up until it finally cooks the part of his brain that controls that particular function. And of course... There were cameras there for the whole thing. If you wish to see the video, go to Blink and search for the name Marvin Hammett. Jesus. That is the reaction they seek. One you feel in your gut more than your brain. So now we apply that to your situation. There was a highly publicized chase to find Arthur Livingston's daughter. Molich's man won. All the cameras were there to see it. Then, with everyone watching, well, Bud said, you couldn't have known this, but in this part of the world, it's considered a grave insult to set a man's pecker on fire. Armando said, you made him look weak, in front of the whole world. So, you tell me, Zoe. Do you think Molech can let that slide, even if you gave him everything? Even though it wasn't my fault? Even though he caused the whole thing? It is not about fairness. It is about building a brand. 
Armando looked back at the group and asked, Do any of you disagree with anything I say? Will said, If she stays here and keeps the inheritance, then she'll be a high-profile target with ten figures and assets for an aspiring kidnapper to ransom. If she goes on the run and leaves everything behind, makes it clear there is no financial gain to be had from going after her, then maybe she has a fighting chance. The impact of what they were saying finally hit Zoe, all at once. She bent over and tried to breathe. I think I'm going to be sick. She was, quite simply, going to die. She would probably not see Christmas. She would likely never see her mother again. The stench machine would get stuck with some owner who probably didn't understand him, or he'd wind up getting euthanized in a shelter. Armando put a hand on her shoulder and said, Come on, let's get you out of here. She shook off her hand. Just, let me summarize. One of you guys says I'm dead if I stay, and the other says I'm dead if I go, but reading between the lines, it's pretty obvious that I'm dead no matter what I do. You people, you've given me a terminal diagnosis with like two days to live, and you're all just so casual about it. Because apparently in this awful town, this sort of thing just happens all the time? Is that how it is? Girls come here and just get chewed up and spat out as part of this dick swinging game you rich gangsters play with each other? She was drawing attention now. People from the crowd were actually giving up their place in line to come see the drama with the rich folks in the parking lot. A teenage girl with a shaved head shouted something about her mother. Zoe met Will's eyes and said, You just look annoyed by this. You know that? Like I've messed up your weekend plans. I'm imagining you in that room with the stupid buffalo head on the wall with all of your other suit buddies saying, Sorry we had to reschedule the golf game. This thing happened last week. My boss died and his daughter came into town and inconvenienced everybody. But that's okay because yesterday she was dragged screaming from her bed and gutted like fish while millions of people cheered on the blink feed. So it's all better now, guys. That little glitch, that little bump in the road is gone forever. Now the men can get back to work. Zoe found a wadded-up tissue in the pocket of her cardigan and tried to dry her eyes and wipe the running mascara. From behind her, Armando said, Zoe, whatever decision you make, stay or go, you must factor in one thing. You are not going to get hurt as long as I am on the payroll. Period. Armando glanced back at the crowd. Many of them were recording the scene with their phones. If they hadn't known who Zoe was when they pulled up, they certainly knew now. He said, Come on, we should go. Zoe stared at the crowd. A little girl was sitting cross-legged at the base of one of the concrete columns, trying to pick through the vegetable stew for the part she liked. Her older brother was standing over her. He had discarded the bread from his sandwich and rolled the cheese and meat into a tube he was trying to play like a horn. Zoe turned and found Echo, who was already heading back to Will's fancy sports car, eager to get away from a situation that was about to turn ugly. Hey, Echo, how many pizzas would it take to feed the building? She stopped. How many what? Pizzas. It's pizza day in Squatterville. You want to come back to work for me? Well, this is your first job. Call Baselli's and order enough pizzas to feed everybody here, and get me a meatocalypse. Echo scrunched her brow. I'm not totally clear as to whether that second part is a separate request or if it's elaborated on the first. And there are over 2,000 people in that building. You'd need 700 pizzas. That restaurant would need a week to... Then you'll need to call multiple places, won't you? Figure it out. Will said... That's a nice gesture, but what those people need isn't pizza. They need real housing and heat, and running water, and diapers and doctors and daycare, and job training, and those kids need to be in school. Zoe nodded. Right, right. Echo, are you writing all that down? Echo said. Are you serious or being sarcastic? I honestly can't tell. Dead serious. And do you have any concept of what that will cost? Will it cost less than a billion dollars? Just do what you can and let me know if we run out of money. Andre said. Zoe, I think what those people need most of all is some condoms and a time machine. Zoe said, Congratulations, you're now partnering with Echo on the Squatterville charity. Zoe rounded the sedan and opened the passenger door. A huge man approached from the crowd, the tattoo-headed guy who had taken Will's wallet. The man had an expression of one headed for the guillotine. He held out the wallet to Will. Mr. Blackwater, I am... If I had any idea it was you, I'd never have... I know. You should have said something... I thought you were one of them lawyers that were always coming by. I would have never... I know. Forget about it. Mr. Blackwater, I got a wife and two kids up there, and I don't know what they'd do if... You're fine. Walk away. Will headed back to his car. The man stood frozen, watching him go.
Zoe closed her door, but by the time Armando started the sedan, the dam had broken on the crowd. As if seen, the bald guy approached one of the suits had breached some invisible barrier that gave permission to the rest. They spilled out around the cars, led by a few instigators who were shouting and laughing, too drunk for a Friday afternoon. Armando rolled the sedan forward, then stopped, finding his path blocked. Zoe asked, What are they saying? I'm going to take a wild guess and say they're asking for money. No, listen. They were chanting something. Zoe cracked a window and heard dozens of people in the crowd shouting the same phrase over and over. Say hi to your mom. They were intentionally blocking the car now, hands in the hood, chanting at the windshield, chanting at Zoe. Armando said, Roll up your window. We're going to do some crowd control. Don't run them over! He tapped some controls, and an electronic voice boomed from the car, telling the crowd to disperse and that countermeasures would be used if they refused. The crowd didn't react, everyone having fallen under that riot spell that convinces normal people to turn cars over and set them ablaze, invincible as long as they do it in mass. Armando punched another button, and there was a hum, winding up in pitch. And then, the crowd was running. They slapped at their limbs as they fled, as if on fire. What did you do? What did you do to them? Armando hit the accelerator and the sedan charged through the now wide open gap in the crowd. They're fine. It's a non-lethal microwave blast. Heats up the water in your skin. Makes you feel like you're getting cooked from the inside. Just a little nudge, that's all. What was happening back there? Why were they chanting about my... And then, the nearest hotel came into view, and Zoe was looking at her mother's boobs. The building, and the one next to it, and the next one was carrying a blink feed from someone sitting in the zombie quarantine bar in Fort Drayton. They were at a table, peering over a pair of empty beer mugs, chatting up Melinda Ash in her waitress uniform that consisted of a pair of camouflage hot pants, gray zombie makeup, and nothing else. She was holding a tray, and it was clear she was doing the fake laugh she did with customers to drive up tips. There was no audio on the feed, but Zoe could tell she was doing her giggle from the way she... bounced. There was a scroll of text at the bottom that said, Zoe, say hi to your mom. Armando squinted at it. Who's that? That, Armando, is my mother. She's at work. Wait, are you joking? No. They must have hacked the Skyline feed. Molech? Or his fans? Zoe tasted blood, had to make herself stop biting her lip. Take me home, with a route that avoids the buildings. And tell Will and the rest I want to meet them there. 18. Both of the other vehicles had beaten Zoe back to the casa, since they weren't taking a circuitous route that avoided any tower carrying the Skyline feed. Zoe stormed off the elevator in the library, and Carlton told her he had seated everyone in the salon, which made Zoe think she would find Will and the rest sitting like old ladies under a row of hair dryers, but... Apparently, that was the name for the fancy room with the fireplace and mounted buffalo head where she'd met everyone the night before. Armando trailed behind her as she flew through the door in a rage, meeting the gaze of Will, Andre, Bud, and Echo, a nearly identical scene to her arrival just 12 hours earlier, with the circumstances having changed radically. Is it still up? The feed? Echo said, We got it down from the skyline, but the blink is still live, and it is very... popular. It's coming from one of Molech's men in Fort Drayton. We think he got there a couple hours ago. Stalking my mom. Where is he now? Is he still at the bar? No. He's inside a house, it looks like. Edgar brought up the feed to play on the wall across from the buffalo head. The wearer of the camera was moving slowly and casually through a dirty living room, past a sofa that had been tortured with cat claws, down a short hallway. Zoe tried to breathe. That's my trailer. Zoe tried to ignore the column of comment text streaming down the bar to the right of the screen, but she couldn't miss that same phrase repeated over and over. Say hi to your mom. It was a Team Molech meme. Will said, We have to stay calm here. This isn't about your mother. This is about you and getting your attention. The person wearing the camera was lazily browsing around the trailer, picking up framed photos, making a point of touching everything, acting like he owned the place. He stopped by the kitchen and started eating from a package of Oreos. He continued down a hall and arrived at a room at the end, Zoe's bedroom. Zoe bit her lip again. And we can't block this somehow? Cut off his feed from the rest of the world? No. You can jam a device if it's close to the source, but you can't just pick a feed and cut it off. 
The man with the camera knew he had found her bedroom, and was freely poking around her meager possessions. He went to the chest of drawers, opened each one, and then found the underwear drawer on the bottom. Over the next five excruciating minutes, Zoe and her new employees watched a stranger slowly pick through her bras and panties, then arrange them on the floor to spell the word gold. Then, he added an exclamation point to the end, in the form of Zoe's pink vibrator. The fans in the comment stream were going wild. Zoe closed her eyes and was pretty sure she was going to be sick this time. Will said, I know it's difficult to see the, uh, positive in this. But whatever the gold is, it's something Molich wants and something he thinks we can give him. That's actually a good thing. It means we have a bargaining chip. Now what should happen next is... Zoe's phone rang. It was her mother. Mom, are you okay? Hi, baby. Can you hear me? It's noisy in here. We're getting six inches of snow today. Are you guys getting anything out there? Mom, do you have any idea? I can't hear you, babe. They got the music way up. Hey, I got a message from a guy who came in. He said he couldn't get through to you, so asked if I'd pass it along. Zoe's mouth went dry. What was it? Hold on, I wrote it down. Can you hear me? He says he's going to meet at Arthur's memorial service tomorrow and for you to meet him there. He says to bring the gold. Zoe closed her eyes. You there, Z? Got it. It's... It's just more stuff about the arrangements. It's no big deal. I can't hear you, Z. I'm gonna go. Have fun at your thing tomorrow. The line was dead before Zoe could even say goodbye. Zoe started dialing again. Will asked, who are you calling? The cops, our cops, we still have those where I'm from. Zoe, think it through. You call Fort Drayton and tell them your mother is being stalked and they'll send out one of their patrol cars to drive past your trailer once every couple of hours. That's it. And even if they dedicated every single officer they had on the payroll, would they be sufficient to protect your mother, knowing what we know about Molich's henchmen and what their capabilities are? So what the hell do we do? We calm down and figure it out together, assuming we have our jobs back. Consider this your tryout period. Your interview involves finding Molich and crushing him like a grape. Then I suggest we adjourn in the conference room. Candy blinked into the room and everyone jumped. In her bubbly voice, she said, We have a visitor at the front gate, and ooh, it looks like he's been doing squats. A voice said it was the delivery from Baselli's, and Armando volunteered to just go accept it at the gate this time. Andre said, Bet you feel silly for almost buying pizza for those people back there. What do you mean, almost? Zoe spun an echo. Have you not ordered the Squatterville pizzas yet? For the people who swarmed your car and screamed veiled threats about your mother? Yes, she said as they filed out of the room. What is it with rich people thinking they can starve the poor into good behavior? They headed down to the mold door, and this time it opened at Zoe's touch. The mansion's security system had apparently been set to answer entirely to Zoe, the whole thing having switched over automatically as part of the terms of Arthur's will. Not much had registered about the conference room when Zoe had been there the night before, other than the strange schematics on the wall monitors to her left and the severed hand that had been sitting on the table. Some thoughtful person had put the hand away since then, and she wondered where it had gone, but then saw a red cooler marked biohazard on the floor and figured it was in there. That would be a helpful detail to recall for when she had nightmares about it later. The center of the room was dominated by a long wooden table, its varnish ruined by cigarette burns and coffee cup stains. Surrounding the table were five well-worn leather rolling chairs. The wall to her right held a corkboard with dozens of photos pinned to it, mostly dead bodies, most having suffered gruesome injuries. At the opposite end of the room was a refrigerator and a counter with a coffee machine nestled behind a mountain range of piled junk food. Next to it was an open door that led to a bathroom. The toilet seat was up. The whole room smelled of ancient coffee and the ghosts of cigars. Music filled the room. It faded the moment Will walked through the door, his personalized theme apparently. It was a man singing about how he'd like to hear some funky Dixieland. The suits fanned into the room and guided themselves to their designated chairs, all landing simultaneously, like four billiard balls rolling into their holes after a trick shot. The suits, back to work, doing what they did. Well, not quite. The chair at the end of the table remained empty. Zoe decided she would just stand. She nodded toward the bathroom and said to Echo, You ever fall in that toilet? 
I would never use that bathroom. It's disgusting. Will waited for the music to fade, then surveyed the room, seeming to come alive somehow. His people, picking up where they left off. All right, let's tally up the score so far. Zoe, you didn't warn your mother she was being stalked. I take it to mean you don't think she's resourceful enough to slip away on her own. Zoe shook her head. I wouldn't have put it exactly like that, but she'd go and try to reason with the guy or something, or just call a boyfriend to come protect her. Whatever she did, it would make things worse. Can we send somebody? That's an option, but you wouldn't want to send one guy. You'd want to send a team, and they don't know who the stalker is or what he looks like, or even if it's a he. Bud said, It is. Had man hands. Saw when he was rooting through Zoe's unmentionables. Had a wedding ring, but no wristwatch. White guy, not much body hair. Probably not Italian or Greek. Zoe said, So what, we're just helpless? Molech can just say the word at any moment and his guys kill my mother five seconds later? Will said, Yes. But you should be asking yourself why he hasn't done that yet. It's not conscience. It's because there's something he wants from you, apparently very badly. And the mother killing Athena is a card he can only play once. So that means we now have two cards in our hand. The fact that we have something Molech wants, and that we know exactly where Molech is going to be tomorrow night. Armando appeared at the door with a pizza box. Andre sprang to his feet and said, It could be poison! He took a piece and started eating it as he headed calmly back toward his chair. He chewed and said, Nah, it's fine. Zoe leaned against the wall with an eighth of a meatocalypse in her hand and said, So just to be clear, we don't even know who Molech is, right? Echo pointed to the corkboard behind Zoe. That pretty much sums it up. A series of photos were pinned together in a pattern, like the suits had been trying to trace the members of a criminal organization the way detectives did on old cop shows. Only here, there was no pyramid-shaped structure to mark levels of lieutenants and made men, just a row of crazy-looking people, many of them dead or dismembered, with one single picture above them. It was a black photo with a white question mark, with Molech scrawled below it. Zoe said, I take it he doesn't walk around dressed as a giant question mark. Echo said, I think that would cause trademark issues. Andre said, He's been playing up the mysterious angles since he hit the scene. Wants us to think of him as something larger than life. Mystical. Keeping us in the dark about what his capabilities are or aren't. We've been working on it, but he's the most blink-savvy player we've ever dealt with. Always keeping the name out there, never showing the face. Bud said, Now, men like that... We found they usually don't stay in the shadows forever. They get to where they crave the spotlight. But when this guy decides to go public, I'm thinking he'll do it in a way that's spectacular. And I mean spectacular in a bad way. Like a collision between a fuel tanker and a school bus. Zoe swallowed pizza and said, Well, we've been told the memorial service tomorrow is going to be crashed by a guy who controls an army of mentally ill people with wizard powers. That sounds pretty spectacular. Will said, and you understand why he's going through this whole dog and pony show, rather than just sending a thug to threaten you with a shotgun the next time you go out to get the mail. He wants an audience. Now you're getting it. There'll be several thousand people at the memorial tomorrow, and probably a hundred times as many watching it via blink. Now that the threat of a spectacular assassination taking place has been made, and trust me, he'll make sure word gets out, you can multiply that number by a hundred. Big showdown. Heiress versus supervillain. Wait, are we talking like I'm actually going to go to this thing? Will, without breaking eye contact with Zoe, asked the room, how hard would it be to get a Zoe look-alike? Bud said, You're talking about an assassination double? It'll cost us, but we could find someone who passes. Will, still looking at Zoe, nodded and said, Yeah, lots of desperate people in this city. Go out to the trailer parks outside town, find a girl with the same build. You'll surely find someone happy to take the risk. For the money, Zoe said, Ugh, you are the devil, you know that? You are the literal devil. All right, I'll go to the memorial service. I'll act as bait for the magical sociopath who wants me dead. Will said, I was suggesting no such thing. It would be extremely dangerous for you to go yourself. Besides, with the kind of wealth you have now, you shouldn't have to take those kinds of risks. Not when there are plenty of impoverished women who would gladly... Stop. Shut up. Just pour some more scotch in your mouth. Whatever it takes to make the word stop. I'm going. Better than just spending the rest of my life looking over my shoulder. Let's just do it and end this, one way or the other. She turned toward Armando. Is there any hope at all at keeping me safe during something like that? As safe as anybody can be, doing what you are about to do. 
Andre said. You'll have help, Zoe said. So, is this just the type of thing you people do? Will said. You mean stage and elaborate traps for psychopaths just to see what happens? Also, we can get a look at their strengths and weaknesses at tremendous danger to everyone in the vicinity. Yes, actually, with some regularity. He turned and tapped the wall monitor. An overhead view of a patch of land appeared on the screen. Here's the park. Echo. We're going to start running down hardware. There's a lot of open perimeter here. That part is going to be an all-nighter for both of us. Bud, start vetting hired guns. Work with Armando on that. Andre, you're already on party preparations. But of course, a lot of your hard work has just gone out the window. You have to completely rethink where you're channeling the crowds. The whole shape of the situation has changed substantially in the last few minutes or so. Don't plan on much sleep. Andre grabbed another slice of pizza and said, Now there's an understatement. I mean, on top of everything else, we gotta get Zoe something to wear. 19. That night, Zoe dreamed about Jezza. The dreams weren't an uncommon occurrence over the last eight years, dating back to when Zoe was in high school. She and her mother had lived in an apartment in a public housing complex, a cramped two-bedroom place with sticky linoleum floors and walls that smelled like old grease, but by far the worst thing about the place was that none of the interior doors locked, not the bathroom, not her bedroom. Zoe had never understood how fundamentally she had relied on the ability to lock out the rest of the world until Jezza Lewis had moved in with them during her freshman year. Jezza was her mother's boyfriend at the time, a sleazy British guy whose hobby was accidentally walking in on Zoe every chance he got, on the toilet, in the shower, when she was changing. He went and do it every time. She'd be safe for a week, or a month. It was just often enough that it was always lurking in the back of her mind. And then, during some vulnerable moment, he'd burst through the door, playing it off like a hilarious faux pas because, hey, we're all just family here, right? Then, he'd get a good look before he backed out. Zoe had told her mother, who had just laughed and talked about how one day they'd get a bigger place with two bathrooms and locks in the doors, and how Jezza was getting more and more DJ work all the time. The whole thing ended when, one day, Zoe stepped into the bathroom to take a shower and immediately noticed cracks in the plastic housing of the ventilation fan in the ceiling, like somebody had messed with the fan but was too stupid to know how to get the cover off without breaking it. She figured there was a better than ever chance that there was now a little wireless camera up there, because she had been expecting Jezza to do something like this, and that was the only spot to hide a camera that could see down past the shower curtain. That meant that everything she was doing was likely being fed wirelessly to Jezza's ancient laptop, the same one he used to play music at his DJ shows while he stood there and flapped his arms around as if the computer wasn't doing all of the work. Zoe could have waited until her mother got home and then showed her the camera, or she could have stood up on the toilet and ripped the thing out of the ceiling. She could have done a lot of things. Instead, she undressed and took her shower. She took her time and dried herself off slowly. Then, she got dressed, found the laptop to confirm her suspicions, then called the police. Zoe was 14, which meant the video file in Jezza's laptop was child pornography. Jezza had two prior offenses, surprise, surprise, which explained why he had such a strong reaction when he realized what Zoe had done. She still had the scars. When the cops dragged him away, Jezza swore he would come back and find Zoe and finish making her pay. He described his payback in graphic detail. It was clearly something he had spent considerable time thinking about. Six days later, someone at Zoe's school found the shower video on the internet. It had been a live feed, it turned out. And within 24 hours, every single one of her classmates had seen it. A week later would mark the first and only time Zoe tried to commit suicide. She swallowed a bottle of over-the-counter sleeping pills, but vomited them back up after she passed out. Regardless of his gruesome promises, Zoe had never seen Jezza again. Outside of her nightmares, that is. In her sleep, he visited her time and time again, magically appearing at her most helpless moments yanking back a shower curtain, ripping off a blanket, swapping in his body for Caleb's halfway through a sex dream. This particular time she dreamed she was back home, sleeping on her futon, and woke up to see him looming inches over her with his stupid, greedy eyes and hot garbage breath. And once again, Zoe felt those hands clamp down, his impossible strength, just as she'd felt it that day in the kitchen when he came after her, the sounds of muffled sirens in the distance. 
Until then, she hadn't known a human could be that strong. This scrawny little tattooed DJ, crushing her under his hands, amped up with a power that courses through every predator upon the sight of quivering prey. He grinned a grin so wide it threatened to sever his face and said, Come back off the ice, sweetie. Zoe's eyes snapped open, and she found she was alone, in the tomb's silent guest room, stench machine busily licking himself at the front of the bed. She sat up and pulled on her jeans and decided she needed to get out of this room. She headed out into the hall with stench machine in tow, trying to decide if her situation had gotten better or worse since she had done the exact same thing about 24 hours ago. She thumped down the stairs, and upon sight of the massive bronze door, she thought, Just go. She would be able to this time. The mansion's security system listened to her now. She could stroll right out, across the grounds and through the front gate. She could walk to a Mercedes dealership and drive off with a luxury car to take her back to Colorado. Sure, it was the middle of the night, but she was rich. She could probably just take one and leave a note telling them to put it on her tab. The next day, they'd send her a bouquet and a card, apologizing for not being open. But then, for the rest of her life, she would be right back to where she was at 14, in that place without locking doors, always waiting for some monster to come smashing in after her. She arbitrarily decided to head right, through the arched doorway to the east wing, the same way she'd gone the night before. Might as well get a look at the house she owned. She found that a lot of the first floors seemed to be dedicated to entertaining guests. In addition to the dining room and kitchen she'd already seen, she found a movie theater, featuring 20 leather recliners and a professional popcorn machine. And the most impressive thing about that room, she thought, was that it had clearly been used. Uh, having your own movie theater sounds like the kind of gaudy feature a rich person demands in their mansion and then never sets foot in, since it's not like you can't just kick back on the sofa and stream a movie to the wall, or on your phone, or your glasses. But this room smelled of cooking oil and artificial butter and cigars, and the seats looked worn, several bearing stains and cigar burns. There were scuffs on the seat backs, where guests in the rear row had casually propped their feet up. She saw people relaxing, laughing, eating popcorn, <laughs> movie night in the Livingston Place. Next door to the theater was a room that had been turned into a massive ball pit, like they had at a Chuck E. Cheese, about 20 feet by 20 feet of plastic balls that were chest deep on Zoe when she dove in. When she climbed out a half hour later, she found that across the hall was a room with padded floors and walls full of harmless fighting gear, foam batons, and overstuffed boxing gloves. The entire floor was a black mesh, and Zoe almost fell over when she tried to step on it. It was bouncy. The whole floor was a trampoline. A lot of the gear in the room was little kid size, and Zoe immediately pictured a dozen adults all retiring to the theater to watch a movie over beer and popcorn while everybody's kids went and screamed their heads off in the play areas. Farther down the hall, in a private area around a bend, there was a black-tiled room with a massive jacuzzi in the center, surrounded by live plants to give it a jungle feel, at least half the foliage was hemp, and a waterfall along, along one wall. There was a wet bar at floor level along the jacuzzi, so you wouldn't even have to get out to get yourself a drink. A woman's bathing suit top was still draped over one brass rail. An invitation to Arthur Livingston's estate it didn't mean black ties and cocktails, Zoe realized. People had the time of their lives here. She doubled back to the foyer and headed up the stairs, past the buffalo room. The rest of the second floor seemed to be mostly bedrooms. Some of them had personal items and toiletries lying around, stuff she assumed belonged to frequent guests who knew they'd be back. People who hadn't known that the last time was in fact the last time. People who, no doubt, had been crushed by the news about Arthur. A whole constellation of friends and acquaintances that Zoe could barely comprehend. She had 15 contacts in her phone, and 9 of them were friends and family of Caleb's, people who, if she tried to call them, would see her number and roll their eyes before sending her to voicemail. Arthur could summon twice as many within five minutes, any time he didn't feel like watching a movie alone. She was headed back toward the West Wing when she ran across a life-size statue of Arthur Livingston, set back into the wall of the second-floor hallway. Zoe actually laughed out loud. The statue depicted Arthur with a walking stick, one leg raised onto a mound of earth as if he was in the process of scaling a mountain. The statue had an elaborate mustache, just as she saw Arthur wearing in his hologram, and close inspection revealed that it had been added later. She could see the tiny welds where it had been attached to his upper lip, and it wasn't as tarnished as the rest. 
Zoe wondered if some poor artist would have had to come cut the facial hair off the statue again if the real Arthur had lived long enough to shave his. Etched into the base of the statue were five words. There is always a way. As she was reading it, a mechanism clicked and scraped, and the statue slowly rotated away, revealing a staircase that went straight up. Zoe didn't even realize the house had a third floor. She cautiously climbed the stairs, half expecting to find a torture dungeon or piles and piles of cocaine. Instead, she found a master bedroom, another space haunted by the ghosts of ancient cigars. The first thing that registered was that there was a car parked in the middle of the room. The second was that it was raining outside this room, and only this room. The car, it turned out, was a grown-up version of the little plastic race car beds that kids have, only this one was made from an actual car, some kind of old-timey, very expensive-looking sports car that had the entire middle cut out and replaced with a keen size mattress. It had real tires and everything. As for the rain, Zoe moved over to the one giant bay window that overlooked the courtyard she also didn't even know was there until that moment. Raindrops were drumming against the glass with a perfect, soothing, sleepy rhythm. There was a brass switch near the window, and when she hit it, the rain stopped. It was some kind of sprinkler device outside, supplying an instant, lazy, rainy day with the flip of a switch. Zoe wandered around the dead man's room, feeling like she was intruding. One wall was dominated by framed photographs. Arthur Livingston with the president. Arthur Livingston with a player from the Utah Jazz. Arthur Livingston at a casino with an old guy in a suit who Zoe didn't know, but she was sure she had seen on the news. There were dozens of these pictures. Arthur and famous people. Arthur and tuxedos. Arthur demonstrating what a big shot he was. Under the photos was the obligatory wet bar, and in the corner next to it was a punching bag, well used, with a pair of gloves hanging on a nail nearby. Next to it was a massive bookcase full of antique leather-bound volumes, all of the classics of literature. Zoe went to pull one of them from the shelf and found they were all glued in place. There was a vanity topped with bottles of aftershave and a single comb with a few loose gray hairs woven through. There was a narrow door to a surprisingly small bathroom with an old-fashioned tub and sink with brass fixtures, a lone toothbrush lying on the counter. Zoe had to force herself not to wonder where exactly Arthur's teeth were right now. On the opposite wall from the bathroom was an identical door that Zoe assumed led to a closet, but when she stepped through it, she was suddenly in a Brooks Brothers store. The closet was an entire separate room packed with suits. There had to have been 500 suits on the racks covering the walls. At least. In the corner was a pedestal of mirrors for fitting. Altogether, more floor space dedicated to the closet than the entire bedroom. Zoe turned back to the bedroom, and it registered with her that the room looked rumpled and harried, drawers partially open, some clothes tossed onto the floor, a box of old letters having been pulled out from under the bed and rifled through. The room had been ransacked, though gently and respectfully. Arthur's own people had surely done this, of course, in the frantic search for the key immediately after his death. Zoe heard footsteps in the stairwell and froze, actually having a ridiculous moment when she frantically looked around for a place to hide, but of course this was her master bedroom now. She could squat and pee on the floor and nobody could say a word. Armando appeared in the door and said, There you are. I thought you were in bed. Then I heard you laughing at something. Did you know this was up here? No, I just stumbled across it. I couldn't sleep, so I figured I might as well take a look at my house before it winds up getting bequeathed to somebody else after I die tomorrow. So that's how it is. You're going to insult my bodyguard skills right to my face. Sorry. If it makes you feel better, I'm sure you'll also die trying to save me. Zoe went and sat on the ridiculous race car bed. On the nightstand next to it was an antique-looking bronze Buddha figurine that looked like it was in the process of blessing an ashtray full of cigar butts. There was a half-empty water glass, sitting on top of a Christmas card from somebody named Gary that had been used as a coaster. She pulled open the top drawer. Aspirin, antacids, chapstick, reading glasses, a revolver. Zoe asked, You have any problems with the plan tomorrow? Me acting as bait? Well, you know I can't just shoot Mulch on sight, right? Tabula Rasa is lawless, but not that lawless. But we're going to staff up the event, make sure that if he does make a move, we're there. I thought you'd tell me to stay home. That's actually the one thing I can't ever tell a client. Personal security would be an easy job if we could just make the client stay indoors. Zoe pushed the drawer closed, and something just happened to catch her eye, in the split second when the shadows fell over the contents inside. 
a tiny blue pinprick of light at the corner of the reading glasses. Zoe opened the drawer again, studied the glasses, and then put them on. She expected nothing, maybe an empty inbox floating over her field of vision, figuring the glasses were an unused gift from a younger friend or girlfriend that Arthur had tossed in a drawer and forgotten. Instead, a burst of code flew down from the screen, appearing to her eyes to be scrolling down from the ceiling. Then the room disappeared, as Zoe's vision went black. A line of white text appeared in front of her. Welcome, Zoe. 20. Suddenly, Zoe was looking down at the city from above, through a filthy window. The camera was recording from inside a helicopter, judging by the thwapping noise that drowned out all other sound. A timestamp at the bottom showed it had been recorded more than 14 months ago, the night of October 4th of the previous year. A hand came into view and glanced at a watch that seemed to have been crafted from about six pounds of gold. The view panned around from a side window to the windshield, where Livingston Tower was growing larger on the horizon. On this particular night, the tower was a screaming shade of purple rather than the dour flat black Zoe had seen in person. The color wasn't a paint job. The screens that covered the tower's surface blasted it in every direction, casting a royal shade across the neighboring buildings and the street below. Zoe heard Armando say, You all right? What's happening? Quiet. There's video. In the glasses. She watched the helicopter shakily descend toward what, from the air, seemed like a minuscule landing pad atop the glowing purple tower, and Zoe decided then and there she did not want to be a helicopter pilot when she grew up. The aircraft finally jolted to a stop on the rooftop, and the wearer of the camera hopped down from the passenger side, then turned and watched the helicopter abandon him there, softly thwapping away into the distance, until the only sound was the soft rustle of wind. The view panned around again and found that not far from the helipad was a man sitting in a wheelchair. Crouching calmly next to him was a chimpanzee, wearing a pair of sunglasses. The wearer of the camera advanced on the pair. The man in the wheelchair, an Indian man in his forties, said, Glad you could make it, Mr. Livingston. As Zoe had already guessed, she was seeing the world through the eyes of Arthur, as if she had gone back to inhabit his body, a living person possessing a ghost. I am Rupert Singh. Please put on these goggles. The man held out a pair of black welding goggles, and Zoe noticed this was actually what she was seeing on the face of the bored-looking chimp sitting next to the wheelchair, rather than sunglasses. She was mildly disappointed. The chimp was picking its nose and looking around, as if trying to figure out why the night was so much darker than usual. The camera panned around and found that, from across them on the roof, stood three department store mannequins, wearing military uniforms for some reason, complete with heavy bulletproof vests. Zoe wondered if the guy in the wheelchair, Singh, he said his name was, had set those up, or if the chimp had done it. It couldn't have been easy either way. The camera looked back and forth from the mannequins to the chimp, and Arthur Livingston's voice said, I'm not making it off this rooftop alive, am I? He wasn't serious. The man in the wheelchair, Singh, laughed. <laughs> I am an engineer, Mr. Livingston, and one who is paralyzed from the waist down at that. Besides, murdering you would be somewhat detrimental to my goal of getting you to invest $50 million in my project. You got five minutes, Mr. Singh. I do not enjoy having my time wasted. I watch the news, Mr. Livingston. You love having your time wasted, as long as it is wasted in a way that amuses you. Yeah, that's true. Put on the goggles, please. They are for your own protection. Arthur took the goggles and put them on, but they didn't blot out the view from the blink camera, Zoe deduced that this meant what she was watching had been recorded from a device other than the eyeglasses, one that was, presumably, more easily hidden. She got the sense no one else in the world knew this recording existed. Sin muttered a command at the chimpanzee in a language Zoe didn't understand, and the primate waddled about halfway up to where the three army mannequins were standing, the chimp stopping about twenty feet away from where Arthur and Sin were watching. Sin pulled out a little controlled pad about the size of a phone and tapped the screen. The chimp extended his right arm, or rather the arm was extended for him, as if Sin was controlling the limb remotely. Sin tapped the screen again. There was a flash so bright that it blinded the camera and a clap of thunder. The chimp hooted and screeched. When the camera was able to focus again, it found that the mannequin on the far right was now a handful of smoking chunks of black melted plastic. The chimp looked mildly confused. Sin said, Impressed, Mr. Livingston? I, uh, I think I need some context for what I just saw there. That, Mr. Livingston, is your tax dollars at work. 
You're looking at the result of over $20 billion in research and development by your Department of Defense. To make a weaponized monkey. Or just a lightning gun. Because I'm not seeing the practical applications of either, to be frank. The chimpanzee had now sat down and was looking at its right hand curiously, as if impressed by his own talents. Zoe wondered just how heavily the animal had been sedated. Sin tapped his control pad again and began his presentation. Let me ask you, Mr. Livingston, what separates a man from a god? What stops you or I from smashing a boulder with our fists or turning a building to cinders with our eyes? Arthur clearly thought this was a rhetorical question, but Sin waited for an answer. Uh, well, not powerful enough, I guess. Power is an abstract concept. A politician has power. The word you are looking for is energy. If you can store and release enough energy, all is possible. Limitations in energy storage is the only reason, for instance, that you cannot fly without a bulky aircraft around you, or that we cannot build a ship that can traverse the galaxy. Even if we can build an engine small enough for the task, the fuel, that is, the stored energy, adds too much weight and bulk. Do you follow me so far, Mr. Livingston? Arthur, in a tone that made it clear he was ready for the man in the wheelchair to get to the point, said, So this is about batteries or something? Sane forced a smile, impatient with the rich douche who wasn't appreciating the marvel that lay before him. This is about the next step in human evolution, Mr. Livingston. You see, several years ago, something radical fell into the lap of your government. An eccentric Russian defector named Reznov appeared one day with a prototype device he called an exo-quantum hypercapacitor, which you may recognize as a name that is made up of two nonsense words. He claimed the energy density of the device approached infinity, you may recognize infinity as a thing that cannot actually be approached. He promised it could turn a man into a god. You may recognize that as a claim made almost exclusively by charlatans and the insane. Yet despite all of this, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency devoted billions in black project money to develop the technology for military applications. I was one of the researchers brought in for what Reznov insisted we called Project Raiden. Livingston said, After the Shinto God of Thunder... After some character in an old video game, note that Reznov was 15 years old and mildly autistic. DARPA's directive was to develop the power source and create new weapon systems around it, but Reznov had higher ambitions. He had no interest in building new weapons. He wanted to build new men. He steered his designs toward devices that could be grafted onto bone, woven through muscle. Devices that could power a man to do, well, anything. All hidden from his superiors at DARPA, of course. Why hide it? Sounds like the kind of thing they'd love. Soldiers who can fly and punch tanks in F. That's what we're talking about, right? You have not thought it through, Mr. Livingston. A boy grows up. He enlists in the army. They hand him a gun. He fights the war, or doesn't, and then gives back the gun and comes home to become a mechanic or a farmer or a criminal. A soldier, in other words, is just a man doing his job. With Raiden, there is no putting down the gun. The man becomes the gun. Think about the relationship between the man, or men, who possess these powers, and those who do not, knowing what they are now capable of. At that point, you are no longer talking about a new weapon. You are talking about a new species, a dominant one. But either way, you had this stuff working, right? So why are you talking to me, and why doesn't the army have death rays that can do to the Chinese what you just did to that mannequin there? I shall allow Cornelius up there to explain. Zoe actually tensed up in anticipation of the chimp turning around and talking to the camera, but that didn't happen. Instead, Sin tapped on his control pad again and told Arthur to put on his goggles. The chimp raised his right hand once more. The lightning flew from his palm and once more a mannequin was obliterated. This time it was vaporized, not even chunks remaining in the aftermath, as if he had turned up the power. Sin tapped his controls again. The chimp raised his arm a third time. There was a blast that sent Arthur and his camera reeling. The view whipped around the rooftop, and when it focused again, the last mannequin stood unharmed. But Cornelius the chimpanzee was nothing but a smoldering stain on the rooftop. Zoe heard Arthur say, Christ! Sin stuffed his control pad into a shirt pocket and said, Riznov's design was highly unstable. We spent seven years trying to stabilize it until, finally, there was an incident in which one of the devices exploded, killing eleven people, including Reznov. Much of the research he left behind was utterly incomprehensible. Soon, the Department of Defense got wind of his more unconventional prototypes and quickly pulled funding. And you decided to sneak some designs out the door to see what the highest bidder would pay for god powers. Sane shifted in his chair, 
not liking the way his whole enterprise had been boiled down to such crude terms. Mr. Livingston, as a man of science, I am not willing to give up on what I consider to be not just the most important invention of all time, but the single greatest leap in human evolution since the species gained the capacity for conscious thought. I got out with 600 gigabytes of schematics and hardware drivers. We could plug them into a nano-capable fabricator and in minutes start building working prototypes. That turned the user into a splatter of pulled pork when they fail. I can fix Raiden. I know I can. The flaw is in the software that stabilizes the capacitor. I was working on a fix when the project was shut down. I was close, Mr. Livingston. I believe if I still had access to the right facilities, I would have done it by now. But I lacked the facilities because I lacked the funds. So I am seeking out a partner with, let us say, an excess of funds. And if the government finds out you're doing this, they would kill me and everyone I showed Raiden to. Gee, thanks. I assure you, I have many bidders waiting, Mr. Livingston. You have many bidders who have $50 million on hand to throw at an illegal weapon project that might not even work? Yes. So, you're talking about underground arms dealers, right? Guys who want to buy this up and sell it to third world dictators and terrorists. I also have Russian mobsters, cartel bosses, Cambodian insurgents, and sub-Saharan African warlords. And one real estate tycoon who is most well known for showing up pantsless to the groundbreaking ceremony for his own casino. So you must understand, Mr. Livingston, that at this point I am as curious as you. I know what those other men want to use Raiden for. The fact that I don't know what you want it for actually makes me more nervous. Who's to say I don't just want to keep it out of the hands of those other men? Maybe I don't want a world full of flying super terrorists who can rip airliners to pieces with their bare hands. That is a lot to pay for a clean conscience. A clean conscience is expensive. It's the reason most men have to live paycheck to paycheck. So you are saying you're offering to pay me the money to not finish my research? Your goal is to bury it? I didn't say that. I'll get you your facility. I'll get you the nano whatever fabricators. Whatever you need. And when I get it all working, what happens then? That's my business. Who knows? Maybe I want to implant all this stuff, put on a cape, and go fight crime.